Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Sachs. How are you? Thank you Over very much. You. Good to be with you. Uh, thank you. Well, it's uh, an honor to uh, join uh, this discussion. I've been listening into uh, all of the considerations. Uh, perhaps uh, I'll be able to add uh, a little bit to uh, this very fruitful and rich discussion. We are uh, still in the midst of a uh, deep crisis, of course, uh, uh, with the COVID-19. So uh, our most urgent imperative is to end this pandemic. Uh, and uh, I won't uh, go into uh, any details since we're all steeped in this morning till night, uh, except to point out that all of our societies need to continue to basic approaches uh, at an intensified and accelerated rate. First is public health control. We cannot uh, relax these controls right now, especially in the US and Europe, when uh, new variants are continuing to surge, the number of cases continues to be extraordinarily high. And the truth is that our societies uh, in Europe and the US have not uh, done well. We have not been effective in controlling this pandemic compared to the uh, Asia Pacific countries, which brought the virus decisively under control months ago uh, and have therefore been able to keep illness and deaths at a very low rate. Uh, there will be time, we will need to reflect uh, why things went so badly wrong. Uh, but it was not inevitable. The second point, obviously, is to accelerate the use of uh, the production and use of vaccines. Uh, and here again, uh, there have been both uh, uh, the dramatic success of many uh, vaccines developed within one year, but at the same time, uh, serious uh, shortcomings in our implementation as we scramble to use these vaccines effectively. Uh, I believe what we need more than ever is a rational, global, uh, transparent plan with timelines for the comprehensive immunization of people all over the world and the adequate financing to bring this about. This is not a matter of one country scrambling to get vaccines. This is a matter of an interconnected world where the virus easily spreads across national and regional boundaries, where variants can emerge anywhere, and therefore where we have to have a comprehensive program to ensure universal coverage of vaccines. For this, we need international cooperation, Europe, uh, the United States, China, Russia, uh, all of which have uh, vaccines that work uh, and that need to be deployed in a systematic way. And we need cooperative financing at the International Monetary Fund and through other international institutions to get this job done. Well, that's the backdrop of uh, any discussion about sustainability and the future of our economies, because until we end this pandemic, we're going to continue in economic crisis. But let me turn now briefly to uh, the future. Uh, COVID-19 should come under control and can come under control in 2021 and it can be brought to very low levels in 2022. And therefore, it is absolutely necessary and urgent that we talk about the coming years, the post-COVID recovery. And here, I would say that the lessons of COVID also apply for the post-COVID world. We need to be far more attentive to the risks that we face in our societies, the environmental degradation and instability that is one of the factors that leads to these emerging diseases, 
but we know that the environmental crises are pervasive. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, massive pollution, and emerging diseases are all reflections of the unsustainable uh, use of uh, ecosystems and natural resources. So when we build back, sustainability has to be at the core. We also learn and know again from the pandemic how unequal our world is and how imbalanced our world is within our own societies and internationally in all of our countries, whether Italy or the United States or virtually any other country, the pandemic has tremendously widened the inequalities between the haves and the have-nots, between uh, more uh, usually more uh, highly paid, educated managers and professionals versus uh, people uh, with uh, work uh, in the brick and mortar retail economy uh, or the goods producing sectors, there has been a huge widening of income inequalities. So when we think about building the future from the COVID era, we need to address ourselves not only to the normal economic regulation, but to sustainable development, which means taking into account not only macroeconomic indicators and variables, but also social inclusion and environmental sustainability as the core. I believe that there's a important good news in this, and that is that the major economies are realizing to some extent the need for this new direction. Europe has the potential for this in the European Green Deal, in the approach that the European Union has set forward for building a more inclusive and sustainable society through several pillars, through the pillars of decarbonization of the economy, the transformation of the transport sector, the introduction of circular economy, the introduction of regenerative economy for restoration of land, the farm, uh, the fork, uh, I'm sorry, the farm to fork principles for sustainable land use, the notion of uh, universal access to digital services, all of the pillars of the European Green Deal are in the right direction for this inclusive and sustainable decade following COVID. In the United States, thanks God, uh, we uh, ended a period of uh, psychopathic leadership, or not even leadership, psychopathic presidency of Trump, and are in a period, I hope, <laughs> of healing, though fragile, because uh, the United States remains deeply divided uh, and with the uh, a great deal of uh, ugliness uh, in our uh, political and, and daily lives uh, each day, but we have a very humane and decent president uh, and uh, a forward-looking administration, uh, and unfortunately, uh, a, a very uh, continuing horrible white supremacist opposition. Uh, and so we're battling a basic battle in the United States but the uh, Biden administration wants to move forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. In China, we have uh, a new commitment of uh, China to decarbonize the Chinese economy and to make the Belt and Road Initiative a green and sustainable initiative. We should be working with China. We should be cooperating in order to put this new direction in play. We should be avoiding conflict, confrontation, uh, new embattlement. We're all much too fragile 
to engage in any kind of new Cold War mentality. Happily, Japan and Korea are also in the direction of a green economy and a, a green recovery from COVID. So the key that I would underscore is that the building blocks globally are starting to come into place for what we truly need in the years ahead. And that is a cooperative approach that brings Europe, the United States, China, uh, other countries of uh, Asia, the ASEAN region, Japan, Korea, the African Union, uh, and uh, Latin America to a common vision of a sustainable investment-led growth in the 2020s, where we're working together on the basic precepts that are underscored in the European Green Deal. This year, we have some very important diplomacy to attend to in addition to the daily battle against the pandemic. Uh, in the second half of this year, there will be at least uh, four highly consequential diplomatic meetings in a year where Italy is chairing the G20 and therefore playing an especially important role in global diplomacy. In September at the United Nations, there will be two crucial summits. One, a UN food system summit. And because of uh, Italy's leading global role in, uh, in the food sector, and I think the best food in the world, uh, Italy uh, can, and because of hosting FAO, and the World Food Program in Rome, the headquarters of uh, global food security. Uh, the Food System Summit aims to move us in the direction of a sustainable land use and uh, food system. Also in September will be a summit at the United Nations for sustainable energy for all. And the idea is to expand dramatically the access to zero carbon energy sources. Again, many uh, Italian companies, Enel and others, are playing a leading global role in this. Uh, in October will be the COP15, the 15th Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, hosted by China in Kunming, China. And this is the opportunity for the world together to acknowledge the dire dangers to ecosystems around the world, including the Mediterranean, uh, including uh, the drylands, including the tropical rainforests, all of which are under unprecedented stress. And to come together in Kunming or online uh, via Kunming, to agree on shared protocols for protecting biomes and ecosystems. Then in November, we have COP26 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Glasgow Conference, which is the fifth anniversary meeting, though it's the sixth year uh, because of the COVID delay, of the Paris Climate Agreement. And that is the absolutely essential moment when all of the world needs to commit clearly and decisively to reach net zero emissions by 2050. We're at the end of the story of climate safety. We've already reached 1.2 degrees Celsius warming compared to the pre-industrial level. We are seeing climate shocks of unprecedented ferocity all over the world, storms, hurricanes, floods, droughts, forest fires, <coughs> and other ills coming from a destabilized climate. And we must finally 
do what we have promised to do since 1992, since we signed the Framework Convention, and that is to end the emissions of greenhouse gases and stabilize their concentration so that we avoid disaster. So let me uh, just conclude these brief remarks by emphasizing that we cannot think about uh, moving forward without ending the pandemic. And we mustn't think about moving after the pandemic to restore what was the status quo before the pandemic. We have to regard this crisis as a, a, a absolutely unequivocal message to business, to society, and to our governments that what we were doing up to COVID was not working. We were not protecting ourselves. We were destabilizing the natural environment. We were living with growing inequalities, and we must not continue this kind of self-endangerment because we have the way to move in a fairer, inclusive, and sustainable direction. Europe, I believe, can be the world thought leader uh, and actually process leader in this because the European Green Deal is the comprehensive approach that is needed. Europe already is the part of the world that best combines the desires for social equality and environmental sustainability in a prosperous society. So Europe already is in the lead of sustainable development and the Green Deal is exemplary, assuming that it's carried out. So my hope my message, my plea, uh, is that with Italy's leadership of the G20 this year, that we use the opportunity to redirect the world economy, use the upcoming four summits on food systems, renewable energy, biodiversity conservation, and climate safety to get on the right path. We have leaders now in all major parts of the world that want to move on the right path. Let's for sure do it cooperatively. Uh, let's avoid new conflicts and let's uh, build for the future that we absolutely need for our well-being and for future well-being. Thank you for the chance to share a few brief remarks with you today.